everyone. Welcome to another episode of Wednesday Night Conversations. My name is Maria Stefanova, and I am looking forward to connect more and more music educators and their knowledge. We're all at a spot at the moment where we're coming out of a very difficult school year, and we're all looking forward organizing and planning for next school year. We have a very exciting guest with lots of very practical ideas to make next year a success. Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, as we are new to each other's work, I was hoping that you can introduce yourself and what you do at the moment. I don't want to do any disservice. Okay, my name is Brad Maffitt, and currently I am the associate conductor of the Athens Symphony located in Athens, Georgia. It is a community orchestra of about 100 musicians and 150 singers. That's my fun job. My day job is I'm a middle school band and choir director here in Franklin County, Georgia. That's wonderful. And starting with the community orchestra, I um, teach and work in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So 100 people, I'm very, very jealous. Tell us a little bit more about your organization. I know that it's in different tiers, so they're different orchestras. Am I right? Uh, No, we actually only have one orchestra. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, with COVID going on right now, we did break off into smaller ensembles. We just actually finished our spring concert. We did it live, but also live streamed it but it is a full-size orchestra and we are a large community orchestra and we're very blessed being in Athens, Georgia, which is the home of the University of Georgia, to have many musicians who have left the university or doing something else with the university who will join us and come perform with us. So it's really a blessing to be here in Athens. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And as far as teaching and teaching in the schools, um, tell us a little bit more about your school and maybe about this year and how has this year been for you? Well, okay, I am a middle school band and choir director. I teach six through eight band and choir. Um, My band program averages about 100 children total. My choir is 100 children total. This year, we have been socially distancing, and we've been blessed that we have been allowed to keep playing throughout the entire year. And we're in a very rural area of Georgia. We're in the northeast section, and our COVID has not been spiking very high, so we've been in person the entire school year. So I was actually speaking to the kids today about how blessed we are because other public schools may have started doing banding course a few weeks ago because they finally got the green light. But we've been going full tilt. We have done our concerts um, videoed and then broadcast later. And we're actually about to do our spring concert next week the exact same way. And yes, we actually have been in this position and I have been thinking more and more how blessed we are to be able to teach music and to have music, which is one of the goals for this podcast, to have it yes. more um, known and popular to people. So what I was hoping to chat with you today is outreach, organizing, fundraising, and everything that has to go behind the scenes in music organization. Now, um, many people may not realize how much we actually do once we are not on the podium. And whether you teach elementary music, middle school, high school program, whether you're in a community orchestra, or whether you're at the professional level, it is the same idea that what you do behind the scenes matters just as much as the music itself. And organizing, scheduling, fundraising, and outreach uh, could be just as important and sometimes more than the music itself. Yeah, I agree. Um, I found asking other conductors about their community experiences, there are really two types, I'm sorry, three types of community orchestras that how they are done. One is the conductor is just completely in charge. It's the conductor's baby. They say, oh, okay, we're going to do this. And he's in charge of fundraising. She's in charge of uh, making sure everyone's there and attendance and all that stuff. Then there is the board. If you have a board, either the board can look over the orchestra and say, okay, this is what we want to do. And they bring in the conductor to do how they plan on uh, doing the orchestra. Um, Disadvantage of that is if the conductor wants to do an all Beethoven and someone on the board says, well, we'd rather do Brahms, you have to listen to the board. Lucky me, with the Athens Symphony, our founder, Albert Ligotti, who uh, started this 47 years ago, wrote the bylaws so that the conductor was in charge and the board's job is to raise money and raise the public awareness. 
So the conductor really doesn't do too much fundraising. The board does that. But I truly believe that with any orchestra, the conductor is the face of the orchestra and needs to put themselves out in the community, be seen, and put a good front so that the community will want to come see the orchestra. One of the things we like to do with social media nowadays is we like to put things on um, our Facebook, like we have a musician of the week. We have our tiny space concerts where we will ask a musician just to put on a three minute song, um, things such as that. We're trying to get the orchestra out there because if people don't come to you, you're not going to survive very much longer. Do you think that we are using social media enough as musicians? Glad you asked that. No. Um, I thought we were. And then lucky me, a former student of mine named Savannah Bruton has graduated with her master's from Liberty University with a degree in social media. And she's looking for organizations to help out so she can build up her portfolio and she volunteered to help us. And I sat down with her two weeks ago and I was just blown away at the amount of things that you can do in social media to keep your name out there. Um, I have another friend who's our concert master, uh, Serena, who is on Instagram all the time promoting what she is doing. And that's what I think we as musicians have to do because we are our own product. We have to get it out there where the public can see it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about social media and what exactly you do in your classroom. Um, yeah, I was speaking with my uh, middle school students just the other day that we have an Instagram account. And they're like, oh, we have a band Instagram account. And I'm like, yes, we do. And I realized being a teacher, I have to do everything in the world, but I don't have time for social media and I'm not savvy at it. So I put it on my iPad and I'm allowing them to take pictures of themselves having fun in the classroom and put it on social media. That way they have an investment in it. And they can t they'll share that with their friends. Look what I did in band and help promote the middle school band. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that actually led to my next question I was hoping to ask. How do you train your students to be helpful with the program and also with the community orchestra? How do you develop that communication with board members and the larger members of the community with what you would like them to do for the community of the orchestra or the community of the mid school orchestra? Well, you say, how did I train my students? I think my students trained me. Um, for example, when we were talking about Snapchat just the other day, I have a Snapchat, but it's only to keep up with my children who are on Snapchat. And so my students had to show me how to do the Bitmoji, how to make myself look good, all this other stuff. So I don't really train them, they train me. But when they train me, I say, hey, couldn't we also do this with it? Something they might not think of. Now, as far as the orchestra goes, I'm really amazed, especially with the Athens Symphony, how many people really want to be seen. When, um, when COVID hit, we started our Tiny Space concert. And we were, our goal was to put one up every week. And at one point, we had a six-week waiting list for people who wanted to perform. And all I have to do is perform and someone will pick up an instrument and play it. You just have to ask. Um, if you sit back and wait, they're going to assume, hey, he's got enough, we're fine. But you have to get out there and ask, you have to promote them. And, and that's what I'm hoping Savannah will be able to do with us. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on recruiting? Recruitment time for me at the middle school is like the major league draft. I really live for it. I enjoy it. I, I enjoy speaking to the kids and trying to invite them into my program. The problem is, of course, with this year, I can't meet with the kids as individually as we have in past years. Um, we use the program Google Classroom at my school to give the kids assignments, to communicate with them. And through that, we can also access every student's email in the school system. So I came up with the idea, why not create a Google cl Classroom for my band, for my course, and send out invites to the fifth graders. And I sit, I've sent out invites, they've signed up for the classroom, and I'm communicating with them through email. I've sent, welcome to the band program. Uh, next week, I'm going to have a, you know, we're going to have a meeting, a parent meeting, but it's going to be over Zoom. And the great thing about that is, of course, in Zoom, they can type their little comments, their questions, and I can just look over to the side and address it. And that way, people aren't raising their hand asking the same question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. And also, for next year, we all know that we'll have to do quite a bit of rebuilding of our programs. Um, and this episode may come 
in the summer, so people may be watching it during the summer. So what would be some ideas or some tips you could give middle school band directors or orchestra and choir directors for a, I don't want to say regular school year, but let's just call it that. Okay, I've got a secret weapon that I discovered this year. There is a program called Cameo. Cameo is where you can hire a famous person to wish someone happy birthday, to send a message to someone. And we've uh, gotten a famous actor for, from a children's show. Kevin, his last name uh, escapes me right now, but he was a butler on a ch children's TV show. And he did an intro for us just saying, hey, fifth graders, we'd love for you to join the band program. It's an awesome program. I was in band and chorus when I was your age and look what happened to me, stuff like that. And I sent that to the fifth grade teachers and said, show this in class. And then in their Google Classroom, click this link. And first they showed the video and the kids freaked out from what I understand. They wanted to know how we could get someone like that to support our band program, how we knew him. And then the link just asked four simple questions. What's your first name? What's your second name? What are you interested in? And, or in what school do you go to? It's as simple as that. And the kids enjoyed the link so much, they immediately replied and that got the ball gold. Also um, our high school band, took their drum line to all the elementary schools, walked around playing, and got the kids really motivated to do that. And that's one of the things I really think has to happen. You have to do concerts for those middle schoolers, but do something that's fun and exciting. Don't just go and play the nice little Bach piece for a high school band. Play a drum line piece, play a pet band piece, play something that gets them excited about being in band. Mm -hmm. Is there orchestra at your school or is it just choir and band? It is just choir and band. I see. Okay. Um, well, we'll just stick with the band ideas then. <laughs> um, however, the Youth Symphony in my town is just uh, starting a fifth grade program and they're really trying to promote it. So the cameo idea was wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll pass that idea to them if you, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Outreach to your fellow colleagues as well as school administration. That could be tricky because sometimes it depends on the situation you're at, but yet, do you have any thoughts, ideas about it? Outreach to the fo uh, fellow colleagues. I love uh, Facebook. There is a band directors group. There's an orchestra directors group. There's a middle school band directors group. There's a group for every type of teacher out there. And I love these because you can interact and say, hey, I'm having this problem or hey, What's a good fundraiser? I do remember um, a year ago, someone hopped on and said, I'm looking for the quickest, easiest fundraiser in the world. And if you're like me, I really hate selling things. It, it, it's usually products that no one really wants, but they're buying it because they'll support the band, support the chorus. And um, what we do instead, our biggest fundraiser is a thon That is where we lock the kids in to the gym and the cafeteria all night. They have to raise $50 in donations for uh, 12 hours staying in, and they play volleyball, they play ping pong, we have a um, movie night, we do all sorts of fun things throughout the night, and it's from 7 p.m. till 7 a.m., and I have about 80 to 100 kids participate, and that's $3,500 to $5,000 for 12 hours, and I didn't sell a single item, and it's a wonderful fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And kids get to play and participate, which is most important. Yes. Uh, actually, us orchestra directors could learn quite a bit from band directors as far as fundraising. This is the one thing that we can really listen to you guys. So what are some other ideas uh, and other activities that you do for fundraising? Really, I do that. And then in the fall, I do a um, rockathon where you have to sit in a chair for six hours. I don't only do those, those two things and I'll have about five to eight thousand dollars a year to work with and i am a small program i don't get funding from the school but that can pretty much cover me for the rest of the year mm -hmm. great tell us a little bit more about a rockathon how exactly is it scheduled well the rockathon came about because we do our wakeathon in the spring and it's something i did in middle school i remember it and i loved doing it but i found out that the sixth graders the new kids had to be kind of trained how to fill out a form, what they're supposed to do, how to follow the instructions, because they were having problems at the Wakeathon. So I created the Rockathon, which is only six hours, still has the form to fill out, still has the other things to do, but this way they get trained to do the big Wakeathon. 
And at, at the Wakeathon, we do we do rewards sometimes. I have a friend down in Athens who whoever raises the most money can take them and five of their friends on a limo ride to a restaurant in Athens where their food is paid for. Sounds like a lot, but whoever raises the most, all that extra usually pays for the dinner in the limo. <laughs> Are limos still popular? I'm, I'm just kidding. To little kids? Yes. <laughs> I'm from the Southwest, so maybe we think differently here. Um, so what if a brand new orchestra or band director was watching and they're not quite sure how to organize those events? Walk us a little bit more just step by step. What are the forms? What do the kids do? What do they play? How is it scheduled? Okay. Let, let's work on the wake upon because that to me is the best one of all. Um, there, we have a list of rules and rules are you have to, the, okay, for the wake -a-thon, you have to be there at 7 p.m., you can bring anything you need to survive, as I say it, as long as it does not disturb other people. Don't bring your band instruments. Don't bring guitars. If you're going to play video games, try and use headphones or keep the sound down. Uh, since we're middle school, we have limitations onto the rating of the movies. We have limitations onto the rating of the video games. And the kids always like to push that by saying, you know, well, my mom lets me play it at home. And my reply is always, well, our principal is going to be walking around. If he sees you playing it or watching it, are we going to get in trouble? So you make your list of rules. And then I have, as I said, a pledge sheet. Um, you can either get donations from people or you can get $2 an hour for every hour you stay awake or $3 an hour for every hour. Um, a lot of the parents just like the idea of, hey, we can have a night to ourselves, and they'll just donate the $50. Now, another thing you might want to remember is if you decide to take a trip and the kids need to pay for their trip, what I do is I say, okay, you have to raise your $50 for the wake -a but anything over that goes towards your trip 100%. So they might go to mom and dad and say, okay, give me the $50 for the wake -a Then they go to aunts and uncles and try and raise more money because that's going to help them pay for that trip. What I do is I ask the kids, what would y'all like to see? And it's usually a dodgeball tournament between the grades. There's a knockout tournament by playing basketball. There used to be a womanless beauty pageant that we would do. Um, one year, they asked me to bring my barbecue smoker, and I cooked barbecue for them all night. And at the end of the night, they sat there and pulled it, and we sold it the next day. Um, usually, the kids take care of themselves, especially today. They will bring to this wake -a they will bring couches. They will bring big TVs and game systems and, and movies, and they'll just make their little camp out sites and just enjoy being with, with each other all night. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, the Rockathon. Let's go into it. Rockathon is just the Wakeathon hat. Um, <laughs> now, the Rockathon is also on a Friday. It's from 4 p.m. until 10 p.m. Here are the big rules that I've had to do it. I've built this on years and years of experience. Number one, you have to bring your chair the night before on Thursday. If you don't bring it the night before, you're not doing the rockathon. Your money has to be in the night before. Otherwise, you're not doing the rockathon. Then our school gets out at 3.30. At 3.30, all kids who are doing the rockathon go to the cafeteria with their golden ticket. It's a yellow ticket that I give them with their name on it showing, yes, I have paid. I'm going. Then I pulled out a bucket and I call the eighth graders. Eighth graders are the next ones. They get to go first. So they put it in and they run down to the uh, choir room where everything's been stored all night. And we don't do choir in that room that day. We do it in the band room. That way the choir room is locked up. There's no chance anyone's going in there and stealing something. So eighth graders grab their stuff and they set up seventh grade and sixth grade. Then at four o'clock, you have to be in your chair. It can be any type of chair. As a matter of fact, the smartest thing I ever saw was a bunch of girls brought bean bags and made a circle with them. And that way they could go from bean bag to bean bag without being out of their chair and put all their food in the middle and shared it throughout the night. So at four o'clock you start. At 4.50, they're allowed to take a 10 minute bathroom break. And they run up and down the hall burning off the energy. Then at five o'clock, we start it again. And it's a He's going that way every hour. It's 50 minutes, then a 10 minute break until we hit 940. And then they start to clean up their stuff. And each group, there's always nests, uh, little groups. They're in charge of making sure their area is cleaned up. My chaperones are in charge of a nest to make sure that it is approved. Yes, this area is clean. The kids take their stuff outside, uh, put a steam it. When their parents get there, they go out, grab their stuff, 
and they go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. I'm sure the band director at my school will be very excited about this episode and he'll be putting things in the comments afterwards. However, uh, if the program, the music program was a little bit tinier and you have less kids to work with, that changes the dynamics with fundraising. So do you have ideas that may be more appropriate or um, effective for that situation or that scenario? Okay, got a few ideas. First off, my first job was a very tiny band program. Um, the entire middle school was 300 children. So that's actually when I started the Wakeathon because it was perfect for a small school. Now, small schools can also find ways of Maybe you can sell concessions at one of the um, football games, but usually the football team is doing the concessions. So another option might be find a team that doesn't have concessions and sell it. For example, at our school, we've got a cross country team that doesn't sell concessions. And I've thought about for years, the one home game they have, what if we sold something? Cause there's about five to 600 people there and it's supper time and I'm sure they'd like to eat. That's one option. What if you did things for donations? What if you went out and played at the local retirement center and they gave you a love offering, a donation? Um, at our concerts, we don't charge for concerts, but we would put a bucket at the door. And if you have a don want to give a donation, we'd love to accept it. Um, little things like that, but also not only just raising money, but uh, the public awareness. I remember one time at that small school, at the beginning of the marching season, the um, football field was a mile from the school and we weren't marching too well that year. So I decided we need some extra practice. So we decided to march to the game. Well, halfway to the game was this restaurant. It's in social circle, Georgia called the blue willow Inn, and it's known for its antebellum Southern cuisine. And we stopped there and decided to play a concert for everyone who was inside. Once the concert was over, they brought out free lemonade to my kids. We hung out and then walked on the rest of the way. We now did that every home game from then on just to get ourselves out there. And from that, people would say, hey, can you come play this event? We'll, we'll, you know, we'll give you a $500 donation. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Are there any fundraisers that you have tried and they just have not worked out and you do not recommend it? And then you want to talk about them. <laughs> we used to sell band fruit. Band fruit, I don't know about where you're from, band fruit is very popular here in the South. Most of the bands do fruit fundraising. Um, my first year doing fruit fundraising, it was all right. We raised about $3,000 with a band of 85 kids in the high school. Um, after I left the high school, I then went to the middle school and I didn't do band fruit with them. I just did not combine. And one year the high school director said, let's do it together because maybe we can fill up the truck and get a discount. So I did it. And you sell for a month. It's sometimes the kids don't have the right amount of money and we have to deal with that hassle. And a lot of the times we had problems with the fruit that came in, that it was not good. It was the wrong thing. And this is right before Christmas. And if we don't get it by Christmas break, these people aren't going to get it. And that year, that last year that I did it, I remember they were missing an entire pallet that had been given to another school. So at that moment I said, you know what, my my Wakeathon makes as much as this for only 12 hours work. Let's just do that. So I'm not a fan of band fruit. Um, cookie dough, I've never really been a fan of. It, uh, it freezes well, but not too many people want it. Now, one thing I wish I saw more of, but I don't see it anymore. There used to be this company that would do pizzas and you could buy them frozen and then you just pull it out, you put the French, uh, French loaf down, you put the toppings on top of it and do that. That I like. But again, trying to find the one fundraiser that's going to make you a million dollars and do less work, I don't think it's just out there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's funny because um, if other music directors were listening, I know that they will be excited about the conversation. But if somebody else listened, they may be thinking, why are these guys talking about pizzas and cookie dough for half an hour? And I think people may not realize how much fundraising actually goes into developing and managing a music program, how important that is, and how much I almost feel like I have two jobs. One is to teach the music, and one is to fundraise, organize, and do everything that's behind the scenes. Your thoughts on that? I agree with that, that statement. 
of it. Sometimes it feels like we have two different jobs. Um, but if I had to explain it to the normal public, I can explain it this way. Um, right now, I try to start three tubas in sixth grade every year with my goal of keeping all three tubas through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Those tubas need something to practice on at home. So if I have three tubas in each grade, that's nine tubas. Those have to be at home. They can't lug them back and forth. They're as big as some of the kids. Now, I do use three-quarter size tubas, so I use smaller ones. But then I'll need three more at least at the school, and they bring their own mouthpiece and just share the tuba. So that's 12 tubas I have to buy. Again, I use the three-quarter size. It's a little less expensive. Each tuba is about $3,500. So you're looking at $35,000 that I need to come up with to replace the tubas that I have in my band room now that are 15 years old. Or how about the bass clarinet that is 20 years old because I don't have a budget and all the fundraising I do through the wake of the the Rockathon goes towards music, goes towards classroom needs, goes towards instruments, things like that. If you gave me a budget of $40,000 a year, I might be able to completely survive and get what I need. But there have been times when I just need to buy a acne siren whistle for a special piece we're doing in band and we just don't have the $40 right now. So fundraising is a necessary to do what we have to do. And it's so important and it's so important for us to learn how to do it right so that our programs can be successful along with the music side of Mm -hmm. our job. Um, this is very a side note, but your district that does not support purchasing instruments, you guys have to do it yourselves? They say, they say they will support, but then I go and say, hey, we need a $4,000 tube and say, well, we don't have enough money for that. Now, I am lucky. I did go to my uh, principal just the other day and I said, you know, our tubas are 15 years old. And there's something called SPLOST, E-SPLOST, which is a penny sales tax that goes back towards education. And the most recent SPLOS is supposed to help the fine arts. So he said the money should be there for those tubas. Let's apply for it. Let's see what we can do. So it does happen once in a while, but it's not, it's, it's tooth and nail. We have to fight for it, but I think everyone in every school has to fight for everything. The baseball team has to fight to make sure they have enough materials also. I see. Absolutely. I was hoping to ask you next about your ideas about grading and assessment for music programs. Okay. Especially with my band, there's something I found years ago that I love. It's a card they have, eight and a half by 11, but it's on card stock. On one side is a practice card. Now, I know what every band director and orchestra director is going to say. The kids are going to lie on the practice card. I've got a solution to that. Hold on. On the back side is what I call pass-ons. Our, um, right now, we are on the trimester, which is uh, 12 weeks. And I give the kids eight assignments they have to do supposedly every week. If they don't do it every week, that's fine. But they have to complete all eight by the end of the trimester. So in other words, instead of saying, hey, next week we're going to have a playing test on this. Now the kids know what they have to do in advance. And they can pass them all off. And if they pass them all off, they like to go to a practice room and practice other music together. And do that every Wednesday. The practice card with pass-offs is due every Wednesday. Uh, the pass-offs, some of them are very easy. Show me that your notebook is in shape. Tell me the order of flats. Uh, I'm going to do an instrument inspection. Let me make sure your instrument has been cleared. Um, but then I push other things. For example, the eighth graders, one of their pass-offs is they have to do four major scales, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, without mistakes, and then a one octave chromatic, also without a mistake. That's one pass-off. And then I'll choose something out of their book, especially rudiments for the percussion for them to do. Now, practice card. I learned the hard way that kids are going to lie on a practice card. They're just going to say, yes, I practiced two and a half hours when they actually practiced five. So I found a way around that. Instead of saying, if you practice one and a half hours or two hours this week, you get a hundred. And then it slowly goes down depending on how much you practice. I say this, if your parent signs your practice card and you have written down how many minutes you practice, you get a hundred. If you practice zero minutes, but your parents sign it, you get a hundred because the goal is not to, the overall goal of a practice card is not to uh, make sure they're practicing. Well, it is, but this is my way of finding out when I sit down with a parent and they say, Hey, Johnny's failing band. Why is he failing band? I can pull up the practice card and say, 
Well, he hasn't practiced at all this trimester. So it's just creating a record. We can have a conversation. One time I had a student who was in a fall sport and when it was time to get the band instrument, they were practicing five minutes a week, 10 minutes a week because they were just too busy. And parents came to me and said, why, why, are, why is my child having issues? And I showed every other kid's practicing two to two and a half hours a week. Your child is practicing five minutes a night. That's where the issue is. And that way it's something measurable the parents can see. And that's the other reason I like pass-offs. It's something measurable. How is your child doing? We're, and I'll send out on a remind um, on the remind app. We've now finished our fifth pass-off. Has your child done five pass-offs? That way they are also finding their child accountable. Brad, thank you so much. Your ideas have been very practical, which we all love as music educators. Um, and I'm really, really appreciative of that. Last question, not so practical, maybe. What okay. do you do for stress as a music educator? And also this year, has it helped you think differently about music in any way? We may have touched on those ideas at the very beginning of the conversation, but still, your thoughts. Let's see. The second question was... The, the COVID, um, music, has it changed me? It really has. I've always loved music, but I didn't realize, I didn't realize how much music is really about me and other people. There are people who can sit there and practice their solo instrument and be fine and happy and dandy. I'm not one of those people. I have to be in an ensemble. That's what I enjoy doing. So when we couldn't have ensembles, I became kind of an emotional wreck. I had problems uh, went into a small depression just because I wasn't around people doing what I love to do. So we, I tried to find other ways of doing that. And, and by do, what I did is when I started the Tiny Space Concerts, I was interacting with musicians. I put together a quartet and say, okay, let's play this together. And it was my way of doing an outlet. And because music is really about the interaction between two, not just what I think of my playing. And I'm sorry, what was the first question again? Actually, your second question was answered beautifully, and I think we can pause there. Um, talking about music being interactive and interaction between two people, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Any last tips or ideas that I may have missed and you may want to share with different music educators? Don't give up. Don't ever give up. There are going to be times when you think you are the worst teacher in the world, you're not. We've all been there. When a kid's not doing well and you want to pull them aside, that's the right thing to do. That's what we do as educators. We're here for the kids. We're not here to show off for ourselves. We are here for the kids. Brad, thank you. No problem.